very much for your statement. Uh, Mr. Tippin, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président. Le Mr. Chairperson, Trade Facilitation Office, Le Bureau de Promotion du Commerce Canada, is a non-profit organization whose mandate is to improve lives by creating sustainable business partnerships between small and medium-sized exporters in developing countries and buyers in Canada and abroad. Since 1980, TFO Canada has provided trade promotion and skills development services to tens of thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises and hundreds of trade support organizations in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Eastern Europe, including Ukraine and has been working in many developing countries and emerging economies for 43 years. The organization has become Canada's leading provider of export readiness trading and import market information in Canada and other foreign markets for trade support organizations and exporters in developing countries. TFO Canada's programs are designed to strengthen skills and competencies in the area of export competitiveness, market development and trade promotion. Looking at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, TFO Canada's work aligns with Goal 5, i.e. achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Goal 8, promote sustained, shared and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all. As well as Goal 10, reduce inequalities within and between countries. Canada's focus is in supporting SMEs located in developing and least developed countries, given the role that these enterprises play in most economies. SMEs account for the majority of businesses worldwide and are important contributors to job creation and global economic development. They represent about 90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment worldwide. Formal SMEs contribute to up to 40% of national, a country's national income in emerging economies, and these numbers are significantly higher when informal SMEs are included. According to World Bank estimates, 600 million jobs will be needed by 2030 to absorb the growing global workforce, which makes SME development a high priority for many governments around the world. In emerging markets, most formal jobs are generated by SMEs, which account for 7 out of 10 jobs. So preferential tariff treatments are effective policy tools to create incentives for SMEs in developing and least developed countries to improve their market access opportunities in Canada and internationally. For SMEs in developing countries, tariff reductions increase their competitiveness in the destination market. This preferential tariff treatment facilitates market access opportunities particularly for women-led SMEs, leading to higher income growth rates and employment creation. Another aspect to be considered are the circumstances under which goods are produced in developing countries and the opportunity to apply a broader perspective, not only based on economic development factors. In Canada has been advancing more ambitious outcomes to promote inclusive trade with its tar uh, trading partners under free trade agreements, including with rigorous and enforceable FTA obligations on labour environmental standards complementing preferential market access. This implies expanding the general preferential tariff preferences under a new GPT plus category for developing countries that meet international standards on labour rights and environmental protection. The GPT and LDCT also provide important benefits to Canadian businesses, given that tariff reductions allow Canadian companies and importers to access to a broader supply of cost competitive inputs. Therefore, Canadian companies could increase their competitiveness in local and international markets, generating subsequent effects in terms of employment and economic growth in Canada. So in summary, we believe that creating a new genera a general preferential tariff plus regime that includes conforming with international norms relating to sustainable development, labour, human rights and a, is a positive enhancement to Bill C-47. Furthermore, extending the expiry date for the GPT and LDCT by 10 years to December 31st, 2034 is another positive development. 
Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Tipman. We will go to questions, and same rules apply as uh, as always. Four minutes, and uh, we'll have hopefully time for a round two if it's required. Uh, we begin with Senator Deacon, followed by Senator Wu. Senator Deacon. Thank you. Second time in a row. There you right. are. Right. <laughs> it's a lottery of sorts. Thank you uh, for both of you being here today, and I can imagine this is quite the discussion that you have around the table and both of your both your organizations and you may not love my question but I, I, I would like to to put it out there so um, my question concerns of course the LDCT program and I appreciate and understand the aim of the program but I do wonder or worry about its effects specifically concerning the environmental and society, societal effects of uh, fast fashion uh, be it underpaid labor uh, water pollution, the ever-growing plague of microplastics uh, in our ecosystem. Between 2019 and 2021, Canada imported goods worth $2.9 billion under the LDCT, uh, with apparel counting for $2.4 billion, which is really 83% of the imports on apparel alone. Put a different way, the LDCT tariffs saved um, the importers approximately $408 million over those three years. My concern here is this program has, has become a possible vehicle to ensure fashion importers have access to cheap disposable goods with all the downside that this brings. I'd like to get our, your, your, your thoughts on this from your perspective. Yeah. Well, I actually like your question because <laughs> um, I, I agree. I mean, it's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge problem, mm -hmm. and it's one that, you know, despite you know, 10 years of, of unions working internationally mm -hmm. with companies, right? It's been quite difficult to get, um, you know, sta standards or standards increased, mm -hmm. whether it's with environmental protection or, or labor conditions, labor rights, and uh, working conditions, safety in the factories and whatnot. So I, I think that, um, and kind of looking into some of the suggestions that the Canadian Labor Congress mm -hmm. has made toward this, um, this legislation, not the legislation, the reforms, um, yeah, we have to do it very carefully, um, and there has to be more oversight of the activities of Canadian and multinational firms in these in these countries. Right? Um, it's it's not like you know you uh, apply these conditions as part of the um, these preferential systems, and you're going to get results. Right? It's not a matter of the rules. I think we have to focus on enforcement, and that requires monitoring, and it requires harder penalties. I think than simply voluntary due diligence uh, requirements on these companies. I need to, we, we need something more <coughs> mandatory, right? We need to be holding the companies accountable, maybe more so than the country, right, is, mm -hmm. is what I would say there. And, and I think the CLC had some pretty good recommendations in their, in their proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Senator. Um, and I also, uh, you know, don't find it that un uncomfortable of a question because, frankly, it is it is uh, a concern. Uh, it's a concern for for many Canadians, and so I can tell you that from our perspective, I think Mr. True talked about it in his opening remarks around technical assistance and being able to help, um, you know, in our case, small and medium enterprise from uh, developing countries, from least developed countries to be able to meet uh, Canadian standards and to, to have good environmental practices and to you know, observe uh, the norms um, is, is, a, is an important step forward. And I think you know, a, a reformed uh, GPT and LDCT uh, would be a step in the right direction to be able to help not just impose or, ha or have a new uh, tariff regime, but also to have the technical assistance that comes with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wu, followed by Senator Boniface. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the witnesses. I have two questions. The first is a, a bit conceptual. Um, I wonder if you see a contradiction or tension between the recent fashion for reshoring and, on the other hand, you know, the expansion of preferences to least developed countries. I'm, I don't expect a lot of garment factories to reshore to North America, but you never know. And if enough incentives are given, uh, subsidies in other words, we could see that happening. Can you talk a bit about whether you see troubling trends in this regard? Yeah. Either of you. Yeah, I do have some ideas, thoughts about this, and I, and I thank you for the question. Um, and I don't know where it comes in, but I, there are tensions in my mind 
uh, in, in specifically in a sense of where U.S. geopolitics is going in terms of isolating certain countries, right? Um, namely China, where a lot of uh, you know a lot of these countries that benefit from the the general preferences, tariff preferences, would have very you know uh, supply chains that would overlap with some of these countries, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there is the potential, I think, that this could be overly politicized, right, uh, in the future. And that's why I talked about in my presentation the need for fairly clear guidelines on how a country is added to or taken off the list, because I do think there is the risk that pressure uh, from countries like the United States or even other pressures might kind of mm. flow into these um, programs, which are very much, uh, you know, that should not be, they should be separate, I think, mm. in my, my view. Did, did you want to add to that? Um, really wouldn't have anything additional to add to this uh, on that particular issue. Well, if, if I could comment on your response and then ask the second question. I've just come back from D.C., where there's a lot of discussion about um, looking at the, the, the provenance of the ownership of companies in LDCs and targeting them because of ownership rather than domicile, if you know what I mean, right? So if a Chinese company <laughs> is in Bangladesh, that company might seem to uh, not be entitled to benefits that Bangladesh would otherwise be entitled to because of the Chinese ownership. So you may or may not want to comment on that, but I'll put it out there. The related question, and it feeds nicely into your point, uh, Mr. Tru, is whether we should be concerned about rules of origin as well, particularly in these areas where LDCs are dominant in, are there some accumulation rules that we should be worried about that might actually exclude some LDCs from benefiting from the preferential treatment? Either of you, please. You might know the situation with rules of origin a bit. Yeah, thank you for your for your question, Senator. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of the the ownership uh, issue, I can tell you that um, a lot of the work that TFO Canada does, um, thanks to support from donors such as Global Affairs Canada, we do uh, look at supporting SMEs that have you know more than greater than fifty percent ownership in the country, and that's a way to make sure that the development impact is is felt in the community, and that's not just a, a you know, uh, profits going back to, to another country. So the example that you gave is one where we, we do our best to make sure that the actual LEC, the, the, S, the small medium enterprise, is the one that benefits from, from the tariff treatment and, of course, the support that we provide. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm not sure I okay. have that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Senator Boniface, followed by Senator Coyle. Thank you very much, and thank you both for being here. Uh, Mr. True, I just wanted to uh, get a little more on your notion of harmonization with the EU. Um, you said you thought that would be, if I understood correctly, better from the country's perspective. What's the downside for, of that from Canada's perspective? Or is there one that you see? Yeah, I, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't thought too much about the downsides. I was thinking mainly about, you know, in the past, LDCs have looked to the WTO, for example, for a more mm -hmm. global application of some of these rules. Because there are, I mean, there's not, I mean, there's a, a handful of countries that do, that do this, uh, richer countries, developed countries. But the rules are subtly different. Um, and it does create complexity for exporters in those countries. So, you know, maybe a global solution is the best solution, but in the absence of that, um, with what's happening at the WTO, then it might make sense. If Canada's inspired by the European reforms, which it, I think it clearly is based on the Finance Canada documents, um, and where Canada doesn't do the data collection, from what I can tell, that the European Union does to look at the effect of mm. these measures. Mm -hmm. um, if the European Union's mm. done all this work, <laughs> and it's and it's better for you know the developing countries to meet one set of rules in both markets, um, you know I think there's some, something to be con <clears throat> considered there, right? Of just kind of taking that policy off that's readily available. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chipman, do you have anything to add or any thoughts on it? I would I would just echo. Um, my colleagues' comments. I mean, when we look at the types of supports that we provide uh, to developing countries, we often have to make the the distinction between you know what are the Canadian regulations mm -hmm. versus versus other countries. So, greater harmonization in that regard would certainly make it uh, easier and, and less confusing, perhaps for uh, for the LDCs. Okay, great. 
That was it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Coyle, suivi par la Senator Sujerba. Followed by Senator Joe. Well, my question was going to be about harmonization, <laughs> so I will quickly adjust to my question. Um, both of you spoke about um, technical and, and you also spoke about financial assistance. Um, and, and assistance is what your organization does, Mr. Tipman. Um, I am curious uh, what, what either or both of you have seen in terms of any kind of uh, shifts in the types of technical uh, or other types of supports that are required and needed, um, you know, to uh, successfully to have a successful impact of the kinds of uh, tariff concessions that we're talking about here. Um, thank you for your your question. Um, what one of the things that I've noticed in my time uh, with TFO Canada is the type of technical assistance has evolved as the you know the the development or agenda has 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 changed over time as well and so when we looked at you know years ago we would be helping um small medium enterprise the the organizations we call them trade support institutions helping them to provide more services to the smes to better understand how to you know take advantage of preferential tariffs how to take advantage of the canadian market in that regard we've now moved uh, along the ways and evolved to greater development impact thinking about you know um, vulnerable populations gender equality social inclusion diversity and and really not just providing technical assistance for those that live in the capital cities, but going into the rural mm -hmm. regions and really, uh, so it's not just measuring the currency of exports sales, but also, you know, the development impact uh, that mm -hmm. results from the activities that we conduct. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Mr. Trude? Um, I don't know what I, I well, not much. I, I just have some notes here about the EU um, midterm evaluation uh, that they did in, in 2018 mm -hmm. around their own program. and. Again, they do much more data analysis than yes. we do in Canada on this stuff. Yeah. But they, they, they said they identified modest overall improvements in export diversification generally for the program, but could not establish a clear link in a lot of cases with the GSP regulation in that case. Uh, and they said any positive impact largely depended on, whether, depended on whether the beneficiary countries had policies and administrative capacity in place to effectively channel any extra resources from you know export performance mm -hmm. to social and distribution improving policies. So, this is kind of like the big picture. You know, like you, yeah. you can't simply open the drop the tariffs and and hope that the exports are going to lead right. to development in that country. You have to be monitoring and and so it does tie together with your climate financing and with your other cooperation on areas of public policy, social services, um, that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson, and welcome to our guests. Thank you for being here today. My question has to do with sustainable development. And I have questions as to the advantages that may be offered to companies that uh, implement social responsibility under a GBA plus model. Mr. Steve Tipman, in, is it uh, expected that certain businesses that are certified equitable, fair trade, for example, or rather fair uh, in terms of, will, will they receive more support under this tariff program, for example? Well, thank you very much for your question, Senator. I agree entirely that the social responsibility of enterprises is part and parcel of the work that we do. And when it comes to certifications, for example, equitable, fair trade, That's not only good for society, but it's what buyers and importers are also looking for. So we do play that role in terms of a social impact. 
tied with the economic impact and what importers are looking for too. How do you strike that balance under this legislation? Are there examples, best practices to emulate when it comes to the social responsibility of corporations? Well, we set the objectives with our partners, objectives that those corporations and companies meet. For example, when there was the Canada's feminist international assistance policy that came out in 2017, overnight we set objectives vis-a-vis -a, -vis a project that was already underway. At the outset, our partners resisted. They were working in IT technology and they said it's not possible. There aren't enough female entrepreneurs working in that sector. But we said, let's work together to achieve that objective. And at the end of the day, the project was highly successful and female entrepreneurs in particular took great advantage of the work that we did together hand in hand with our partners. And that's thanks to government's change in policy at uh, Global Affairs Canada. Second round, please, Mr Chairperson. Senator Ravalia, followed by Senator Richards. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much to, to both of you. Um, I'm perhaps just going to take a little bit of a philosophical type approach to my question. <coughs> Uh, in an increasingly polarized world, how do you see the intrusion of geopolitics into trade impacting the coherence of a trading system that is already buffeted by crises? Sanctions, a new world order, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Can all of these factors eventually impact our ability to continue to do what we're doing for developing nations and the global south? You have three minutes between. <laughs> right on <that>. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an obviously an important question, maybe the most important question in, in trade, right, uh, right now. Um, I don't know how much, say, a, a single program like this, right, um, can only do so much. The, the, the general, the GSP, I mean, internationally, in, in the, whether it's EU or US, the impacts on, you know, working standards, the impacts on exports in other countries, they're kind of uncertain. I mean, there's some big winners uh, like Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam. And then there's everyone else who really does not benefit in the slightest from these programs and barely exports anything to Canada. Um, I think, you know, geopolitics of us versus them, um, you know, democracies versus autocracies, whatever you call it, the French shoring, trying to, trying to trade and deal with people you like and, and exclude everybody else, I don't think that's necessarily helpful uh, or the most helpful approach when we're talking about extreme poverty in, in a lot of countries and, and trying to rebalance economic industrialization in, in, in other parts of the world, right? Um, but I don't have an answer on, you know, the best route. I just, I think there are limits to this program. Um, and we need to be thinking bigger picture with how, what else Canada can do outside of that, um, you know. Thank you. Mr. Tipman, did you want to add to that? I think uh, my, my colleague uh, did a very good job of answering. I mean, <laughs> uh, from our perspective, honestly, I mean, uh, trade, you know, trade can lead to, to job creation, which can lead to economic development in a, in a least developed country, in a developing uh, country as well. And so, you know, the, the geopolitics aside, we, we do, you know, make that connection and, and look at, you know, these preferential tariff regimes can, act, can help although there's, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Thank you. And just to emphasize that, my preface was philosophical, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. But uh, it's an important question, and it's, a, it's a, obviously a big one in, in today's uh, global environment. Uh, Senator Richards, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And Senator Ravalier asked my question. I'll ask it in a little bit different way, maybe a slightly different question, actually. But who, who decides what emerging countries have the moral quorum to be helped? And how do you identify that? Because very few emerging nations have the quality of life and often not the moral views of Canada. 
And if you don't help them, you're leaving thousands and maybe millions of people in destitution. So I'm just wondering, how do you decide the moral quorum and who has it and who doesn't? You just spoke a lot about bringing these moral views into the, into the third world. I would just like to get your kind of idea on how that, how do you facilitate that? That's the philosophical question. That is, yes, that is a very philosophical question. Uh, for us, there's a couple of uh, cues that we certainly uh, look at. Certainly, we look at, you know, refer to, um, in the case of projects that are funded by Global Affairs Canada, we work very closely with the funder and the donor in terms of, you know, the types of supports in which countries um, we're, we're looking to, to support through through our, our programming. Um, we'll look at, you know, United Nations, uh, you know, World Trade Organization. And so our, our role as an implementer is to really uh, do our best to follow the guidance of, of these types of institutions uh, and and, and make those assessments. Um, yeah, again, I, it's a big, I don't know how to answer it exactly, but I, I think there's a way you don't do it, I think, and, and you, you don't do it by, I mean, you think you do it carefully and you do it with uh, as, as many levers as you have, right? I don't think you do it by cutting funding to Global Affairs Canada. Uh, or other government departments that deal with international assistance and foreign affairs and this kind of thing, and redirecting that money, as I think the budget kind of did, um, toward uh, more more North American focused, uh, U.S. focused priorities. Whether it's responding to the Inflation Reduction Act, and I know I'm rambling, kind of getting on a tangent here, but you know you need to fund cultural exchanges. You need to fund things beyond uh, simply you know setting new rules. You need to fund things like in, you know monitoring and enforcement and international cooperation in these areas so yeah that that's important but it's not it's not easy it's not an easy question that you ask I don't think thank you thank you senator um, I have a question before we go to uh, to round two and, and mr. true in your your comments you referenced the Rana Plaza uh, tragedy um, that um, tragedy in Bangladesh uh, created a lot of discussion um, at least in my memory it did because I was I served as Sherpa both for Mr. Harper and for Mr. Trudeau and that issue continued all the way through in the discussions that the G7 was having in terms of looking at ILO conventions, uh, pressuring the private sector. There were a number of Canadian companies who were also uh, implicated textile Im importers. I won't m mention them. Do you feel that um, in, the, uh, in the intervening years, and it has been years obviously, that enough progress has been made? or whether these programs can actually ensure that progress uh, would, uh, would take place in terms of uh, safeguarding workers and being fair uh, to these, these countries for the products they produce. Question, and I'll just answer quick, quickly that I haven't followed up as much as some of our uh, union associates with the Trade Investment Research Project have, but just looking at some of the statements that came out on the 10th anniversary, from whether it's Unifor, the Canadian Labour Congress, or international unions. I think it's fairly, they were all consistently saying there was some great progress at the beginning with respect to building standards, fire standards, this kind of thing. Um, and, and some companies did sign on. But what they're looking for is much more progress on uh, inspections, um, much more progress on like a, having these, these things binding on the companies. There's no legally binding way uh, yeah. to hold these companies accountable, and that's what's needed. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think, I think groups are right to start to look at Canada for, for maybe more. How do we enforce some of those things in Canada uh, and, and not simply rely on, say, voluntary due diligence uh, measures as we seem to be heading in, in that direction? Thank you. Mr. Tippin, did you have a comment on that? Um, maybe not uh, specifically on 10-year anniversary of the Rana Plaza, but certainly one of the things that we're noticing is more... Um, more due diligence, I suppose, from Canadian importers uh, and, and a, a more of an awakening around, you know, the traceability on their supply chain and having uh, more information in terms of the source of where, where goods are being produced. Okay. Uh, thank you. Maintenant, la deuxième ronde. Second round, Senator Gerber. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My question is directed at Mr. Tipman. As you're aware, the African continent 
is the continent where female entrepreneurship is flourishing the most. 27% of women are in fact entrepreneurs. That's among the highest levels of entrepreneurship in the whole world. How does your organisation help these young women and girls in less developed countries where access to the internet is an issue, for example? How do you help them to be able to take full advantage of these tariff programs? First, to let let them know that they're available to them and then secondly to take full advantage of them. Thank you very much for your question, Senator Gerber. TFO Canada is working on empowering women and girls. We have a project funded by Global Affairs Canada called Women for Inclusive and Sustainable Trade. And it focuses not exclusively on female entrepreneurs, but it's a level of support that we offer to female entrepreneurs as well as uh, trade organisations to better uh, serve uh, uh, female-led groups. We're also working hard in sub-Saharan Africa where we are, are providing tools and uh, empowering them in terms of their export capacity. We're supporting them. Uh, for example, we are at CL Canada last week. It's the food fair that uh, took place in Toronto. And there are a lot of female entrepreneurs from both Haiti and Morocco that were showcasing their products there. Question. So how can you help them to become aware of those tools and take advantage of them? Well, there's a lot of training, training of trainers. We work hand in hand with organisations and institutions that are on the ground in those very countries. And you're right, entirely right. One of our main points of focus at this current juncture is developing their skills and digital literacy so that they can better take participate in the economy, social media, electronic uh, e-trade, for example, and also help them to uh, put together websites, for example. Thank you. Well, there are no more um, senators who wish to ask uh, questions, so I would like to thank our witnesses, Steve Tipman, Stuart True, for your testimony today. Uh, I think we've benefited from what you've had to, uh, to tell us and appreciate your candor in uh, answering our questions.